And there's a few more, but it's from the Fifth Amendment, where a court case by the name Miranda versus Arizona in the 1960s said that if you're arrested, you have to be informed of your rights. It can't be arrested and just held, because most people don't understand that, and you could literally just hold people and just kind of put them in a box and sweat them out, which is pretty terrifying. And that's why, if you ever watch a show with any kind of police officer, what's the first thing they do when they arrest people? Yeah, those rights, and they're literally called the, the Miranda rights from that decision. And there's no set thing they actually read. You know, there wasn't like a set thing you have to read this in the court. But a few police, uh, a few police forces realizes we have to do it. They start writing it down. It became standardized, and that's the one you always hear. And this all comes to the Fifth Amendment because you're not compelled in any criminal case to be witness against himself. By the way, you notice it says himself. There's holes in the Constitution. But have you ever seen something where they're giving testimony and they say, I plead the fifth? That's what they're talking about. You do not have to testify against yourself. You can, but you don't have to. Same ideas, you don't have to give, you're not compelled to talk, compelled to give evidence to yourself if you're, um, if you're being interrogated. Uh, when we're at the grand jury, Oh, last one about this. You cannot be twice. They say, um, shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy? Sometimes you see this called this double jeopardy. And what that means is you can't be tried for the same crime once. So those, so they can't, if you are tried for whatever might be. But um, a big one would be um, if they want to try you for some kind of fraud. And they can't say, okay, we, we, we believe that you have committed fraud. You found innocent, okay, we're going to trial up again. <laughs> you found innocent, okay, we'll find more jurors. Okay, we'll find more jurors. Or for murder. Same kind of deal. They can't just keep bringing the case up. Now, there are thousands of laws, so they, they might find you. It is I put you on one, but they have another law coming out. So, but it can't be for the same trial. Same case. Yeah. So that impeachment. Impeachment? Yes. Yeah, so. No, impeachment is totally different. Impeachment is a function, a constitutional duty of the House Representative. <coughs> but that's never happened. There's never been an impeachment for the same crime. There've been. Um, I mean, President Trump's the only one's been impeached twice, and they're two different crimes. That. But remember, the House can decide what the crime is, too. They could be, you know, be literally anything the House wants. We just don't like the way it looks. But that's literally what it could be. Or it could be the wrong crimes. They have that choice. Yeah. How is that So there's so many different laws on the books. What they'll do is they'll charge it for 10 different crimes. And so if you're found, if you're acquitted for five of them, they still get you for five of them. So that's the way they get around it. That's a good question. And that's the Fifth Amendment's kind of a big deal. Uh, we're not we're, I mean, we could go through more, but we have to move on. The sixth, speedy and public trial. And have assistance of counsel. In criminal cases, the trial must be speedy and they must, and you must get counsel, even if you can't afford it. Now, once again, you see the gray areas. Define speedy. Yes. So, so speedy, what they've decided is speedy is when it, when the best speed possible. So if there's a lot of court cases on the dockets, and then it could be beneficial too for, for either the prosecution or the defense to push the case down the road. But yeah, so speedy could literally be two years. Of course, you know, the whole concept of human history, two years is nothing, right? That's speedy. And assistance of counsel. This would be another in a 1960s decision called Gideon versus Wainwright, which we'll get to. 
So don't worry about it right now. But what it basically said is if someone can't afford it, the state must provide counsel. Now, Montana has a very overworked, underpaid public defender system. You know, they work with tails off, you know, they're public defenders. Wow, that's tough work. But um, states like Texas, which has um, kind of less care about people accused of crimes, it's basically pro bono. I mean, lawyers must just give up their time as part of being a lawyer in that state. And so I think you might see the problem with that. Overworked or somebody who doesn't really care doesn't mean the council's good. Doesn't mean that the lawyers are good, but overworked public defenders, why are they overworked? Yeah. That's it. Going to go try. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, we're not going to worry about seven. All that basically says is jury trial for lawsuits. Too. Jury trial for lawsuits. It says originally $20. That was a lot of money then. It's gone up to about 5000 now. But just if there's a lawsuit. Well, let's get to eight. No excessive bail or cruel and unusual punishment. Once again, all these are talking about what happened with the bridge. But can anyone define cruel? My guess is all of our definition of cruel is different. And the definition, you might have a cruel of what cruel is, would change a lot if you're the one being punished. The thing of us, you know, we've all, you know, those of us who've done hard time, we know. Being in jail, I would say, especially if you're the one in jail, it's probably pretty cruel. But then again, if you're the one outside looking in and seeing what the crime they did, it doesn't seem that cruel. I mean, everything is relative is the point. And then define unusual. And by the way, the whole thing about like a prison sentence, like if you commit arson, you have 10 to 20 years in prison. That's all creation of the next century. Punishments would literally be decided by the judge. So it could be anything from going into the stocks to having an A branded on you or anything like that. Huh? Arson, so an A. So, for example, the, the soldiers who, who were uh, convicted of manslaughter for the Boston Massacre, they had M's branded on the thumb for manslaughter. That was their punishment. Sometimes I think that might be better than, okay, maybe not branding, but punishments like that than like 20 years in prison, and then sometimes I don't. Let's put it this way. I have no idea what would be good for cruel and unusual punishment either. Do you see the gray area? Okay, here's we get to the ones we just mentioned. So if their rights, or the people have rights, even if they're not listed in the Constitution, you have those rights. But once again, since there's so many gray areas, I think you might see what the issue is. Yes. Not necessarily, <laughs> but yeah, you're on the right track, yeah. Because people say to women, I have that right under the Ninth Amendment. I say, no, you don't. Because we call, you know. So that's why it says that, but it's really can be confusing. Or uh, you can also have um, the executive or the Congress pass laws against what you would perceive as your rights. So you can go both ways. Yeah. I was just going to ask how people decide well, for, if, if a court does ask in a lawsuit, and then they just decide. So, boy, that's power, isn't it? And then this one, same deal. Powers that don't go to the U.S. go to the states. And that's all, that's the federal system, isn't it? But remember the elastic clause. With that, that's a lot of gray area. And so, courts have all this power to decide all of this. And that's immense. That's immense power. But remember, it's only applied to the federal government. Yeah, when we get to things like, uh, the big one's Indian removal. In, in 18, the court cases were on that. 
And that's going to be, yeah, that's great. The federal government made the law, but we're in the state of Georgia. We can do what we want. It's going to be a really big issue down the road. Horrible issue. The Bill of Rights. And then there's one about paying Congress, uh, paying legislators. That would be round of votes on 1990. So they wait 140 years. 240 years. What am I saying? Math is hard. And so with that, and yes, I have a math degree. College was fun. Moving on. So when the Bill of Rights are passed, this is where we start getting to the federal territory. The first thing we have to do are Washington's precedents. So Washington, in many ways, kind of created the national government. And so what were his precedents? First off, what are you going to call him? Mr. President, not your excellency or your highness. He would not shake hands, though. He thought there should be some separation. Jefferson would be the first politician to shake hands, which is kind of amusing, isn't it? Is what do politicians do all the time now? And I will show you the politician's handshake down the road. When you decide to run for office, we'll talk about that. It's this weird bragging thing. Next, he would settle on two turns, partially out of exhaustion and the political rancor that went on. No pe people could remember more. Um, a lot of people thought about it. So it didn't stop anybody necessarily, but opponents would always say, hey, they want to be king by running more terms than Washington wanted. The court system was created. The Judiciary Act created the court system that still basically functions today. Federal courts, appellate courts, Supreme Court. They created the first Supreme Court. The cabinet would be created and the Senate would confirm. That was unclear. The Supreme, the Constitution says the president creates cabinet loosely based upon writs. And then he gave a farewell address. Now, the farewell address was kind of a, uh, every president does it. It was just a letter that we put in the newspapers. Later on, it would become, become something they would read on TV. Most of them are pretty, you know, blah. Washington, though, um, made a couple of warnings that really showed his fear of what seemed to be happening with the country. Also, Eisenhower has some weapons. Yeah. The cabinet are people appointed by the president, and they carry out the different functions of the executive branch. So, like, you, know, the executive branch carries out all the laws. And so, well, let's get to the cabinet now. We'll talk about it. So, his first cabinet. Now, he also did a postmaster general, but we're not going to talk about those. He created four cabinet positions. Technically, now, what are the eighteen cabinet positions or cabinet level? And so. The first one, Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson was State Department. And the State Department today deals with foreign affairs under the executive branch. It doesn't make any sense. Everyone else calls him like the foreign minister. We call ours the Secretary of State. Loosely based on what the British Secretary of State did, but they actually handled deals within, within the nation. So, right? You know what I said about the State Department? They handle the foreign affairs for the executive branch. So, the Attorney General. The Attorney General, Edmund Randolph of Virginia, and this is going to become the Justice Department. And so they're the ones who deal with the law enforcement and legal matters of the administration. No, they are not the attorney of the president or the, or the, the person who's the president. You know, the president has a, their own personal lawyer. The solicitor general is actually the lawyer for the actual, the office of president. The attorney general is for the country. And they're supposed to be um, not or, or, but impartial. The War Department, even though this would handle all the militias, even though that was pretty hard, that was Henry Knox. And then Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. And the Treasury Department, they'd be responsible. Well, it was unclear. But if the, once the president starts to have some kind of authority to print money, they'll be the ones who issue it. They'll be the ones who issue the bonds. And it's still like that today. So all the different occupations, now there are many more, the government is bigger. For example, we have things like the Interior Department, the Agriculture Department, those who come in the 19th century. Originally, the State Department did that too. Now it's just foreign affairs. 
And in, at the end of the, of the 1790s, they created Navy Department. That would be combined after World War II, and today it's called the Defense Department. But it wouldn't be taught to World War II. So that's the cabinet. And Washington would be shocked because the assumption was all these intelligent, hardworking men who fought so hard for the revolution, all were Federalists for the Constitution. All of them. The assumption was they'd all work together. Did they? No. They bitterly opposed each other, and the focus of the fight would be between these two, Hamilton and Jefferson. Why? Hamilton. Hamilton had a vision for the country that he laid out in two pamphlets, his report on credit and his report on manufacturers. I don't know why I said it that way, but I did. I'll come back to that picture. That, I choose it another time, too. It's from an old textbook. I think it's kind of funny. But the report on credit said, we got to get good credit for the government. We need to be able to borrow money. And manufacturers said the future of the United States is not going to be agricultural. It's going to be industry, meaning copying what country? Yes, which is so ironic. Hamilton was wounded and fought with great courage to drive the British out of the Revolutionary War, yet would idolize Britain. Well, a strange little ironic twist. And this would be the basis of the first factions. Hamilton's vision would start to divide that would lead to the first two parties, the Federalists and the Republicans. Not today's Republicans. That Republican Party then would turn into the Democrats. Don't blame me. I wasn't alive either. So that's what's coming down the road. Yes. To, no, to get more debt. To pay off the old debt so you can borrow more money on it. That's why people want good credit to borrow more. Which I know somebody's saying, oh, we're out of debt. No, no, we want more debt. Debt is not necessarily bad. Debt is not necessarily good. But if you go into debt, you better be spending it for something good. Don't go into debt to take trips to Hawaii. First day I can think of. But we should all go to Hawaii. Hop on a little yellow school bus, take off. You've been to Africa like twice. You've been to Africa twice? Yeah, I've been to Africa twice. Yeah, we shot a freaking zebra. So Which question? Say it again. Yeah, that's when people buy a home. Yeah, they got to go into a lot of debt, and so the, the the better their credit is, the lower interest they have to pay. And since so after starting after uh, the Great Depression, you know, people started having like thirty-year mortgages that paid off over thirty years. Even a tiny fraction of a higher interest rate would lead to thousands of dollars more than people are outside. It's actually kind of shocking how much it goes up. And if you borrow money for student loans, it's the same thing. Same exact thing. Except you don't get a house out of it. So with that, the first thing and the biggest is going to be the assumption of debt, also called the assumption bill. I always call it the assumption bill. But sometimes you might see it something else. Yes. Yeah, this is his vision. There's going to be three big issues coming out of his vision that will divide the country up. And this one is huge. So remember we had all those debts. The colonies, the states, the Continental Congress, Confederation Congress. They didn't have any money. They loaned money with high interest rates, so really high interest rates. And Hamilton's plan was, hey, if we're going to borrow money down the road, we have to pay it back at 100% debt. Now, a lot of people said, no, wait a second. Let's pay them back, but at a lower, maybe 70%. That's called the people who have the bonds would get up, and this is what they would say today, a haircut. I know it seems weird, but they wouldn't quite get 100% out. Hey, you know, we're going to pay them back, but that was three governments ago. We're not going to pay it all back. But Hamilton said, for lots of reasons, we've got to pay it back, all of it. But remember, 
many of these bonds were originally given to veterans. There were poor farmers along the frontier. They're the ones, what is the rebellion that led directly to the Constitution? Yeah, remember Shays' Rebellion. These are these farmers. And they were paid this. They were poor. They had almost nothing. They're being hammered by the bad economy. And Hamilton knew that. Because did they have their bonds anymore? Remember, speculators sold many of these bonds. And sometimes as low as 1% of the value. Now, let's be very clear. For the most part, what kind of people are going to be speculators? Remember that, buy low, sell high. Say it again. They're creditors, and what do they need? You got to have extra money, don't you? To speculate, you have to have money beyond, it has to be beyond your, what you need for survival. So they're called the creditors. Most people can't speculate. They might speculate a tiny little bit. But if you don't have much money and you speculate, wow, are you a sucker. Because all it takes is one bad gamble on the speculation and you're destroyed. So who can afford to speculate? People with wealth. Now what kind of people have wealth? No, but it's all right. Money. Money's different than wealth. Yes. Hmm? Old white guys with well, they're almost all white, European. Still, they don't talk much color then, but that's coming. But yeah, plantations, no way, plantations, some might have money, but most plantation owners, they have wealth. They're, they don't have like lots of cash sitting around. Their money's in land and what else? Slaves. Slaves. So, plantation owners, they have lots of wealth, but not a lot of money. Merchants in cities have money, what little money there is. Now, one of the things that Madison is thinking, we all agree we're all elite, this government's for the elite. Madison's a plantation owner. He's not one of them. Also, the wait a second, who else is a plantation owner? Jefferson. Hamilton was actually kind of shocked. He just said, hey, I'm a genius. Everyone agrees with me. So this is a way to funnel melt money to the wealthy. Now, once again, let's be clear, the wealthy, to the merchants, urban people, either with businesses or in finance. Finance is the loaning and borrowing of money. Banks, investment, stocks, those sort of things. We're not quite to stock yet, but that's today. So he wants to funnel melt money to the wealthy. He wants to give these speculators a 10,000% profit. And just imagine putting $1 down and getting $100 back. And, boy, does that cheat the veterans who you promised. I know they made a decision, but that was out of pure desperation. And so, a few more things. That, by the way, that's uh, Hamilton giving his report on credit to the cabinet. And Jefferson's like, what are you up to? Me immediately. Oh. And then. So, let's get to the assumption. Why? Well, the on the surface, give good credit. If the United States pays back their old debts, especially debts for previous governments, they weren't even the government under the Constitution. That means that people today will be, I'll buy U.S. government bonds. Because I know they pay it back. That's why the whole issue about the debt ceiling, which they basically just pushed back for two months, was such a big deal today. Because the U.S. had always paid back their debts. That means that interest rates down, that allowed them to guarantee that the dollars are going to be worth something, etc. Why? To borrow more money. He wanted the U.S. government to borrow more money. How much? Lots more. He wanted the U.S. government to go into massive debt. And then use that money to build manufacturing and roads and also things like canals, harbors, but also the military. He wanted a standing military, not a bunch of weak militias. 
we'll get to why you want the military in just a second. So, when I'm at Rhodes, have you heard the term infrastructure before? Because that's a relatively modern term. Back then, they would have said like, internal improvements. And we'll get to that word down the road. So, like harbors, roads, and then in the next century, like railroads. So, he wants to pay off those debts to borrow more money. Who's going to borrow this money? I'm sorry. Who's going to be buying those government bonds? Meaning, what kind of people are going to turn around and loan the U.S. government money? The very same people he did what? He paid back their speculators 100% value with the goal to turn around and borrow it back. He wanted to borrow the exact money he just gave, the U.S. government just gave to those speculators. Why? It would have made more sense to take the tax revenues and just spend the money? No. He didn't want that. Creditors buy the bonds. The very same people who are the speculators. Why? Because this merchant class will do whatever it takes to get their money back. If they buy bonds that won't be mature for 10 years, the merchant class is thinking, I want my money back in 10 years. Therefore, what has to be around 10 years from now? The government, and more importantly, the country. They have to support the government, and they have to support the country, or they don't get their money back. So Hamilton didn't want to just take tax revenues and build roads. He wanted to take tax revenues to pay back the old debt, to get new debt, and then buy what? What did he just bought from the merchant class? Their what? He bought their loyalty. He's going to bind them to the country. And that's the biggest thing that Treasury bills do. When the U.S. government loans or borrows money, the people who have these bonds will do whatever it takes to keep the country going. I mean, you might disagree on what will keep the country going, but you bought their loyalty. Heck, even people outside the United States today, if they have Treasury bills, they have a vested interest in keeping the United States relatively strong. Because they got to get their money back. Which, by the way, is a great deal for the U.S. government. Because what do they get in return for those bonds? U.S. dollars. And where do U.S. dollars come from? We just print them. So what a great deal. I mean, just imagine if you had something that you just make out of thin air and people will pay you for it. Wow. By the way, people can't do that. It needs a government taxation and borrowing. So they just bought their loyalty. What does it tell you about Madison or Hamilton's view towards the merchant class? What kind of people are they? What are they? Say it again, I've heard Maybe they're not even smarter, but if you got to buy their loyalty to be loyal to the country, what are they? What do you call someone who just does things for money, like a soldier? Just, they just do whatever it takes to get money. They're only loyal to the U.S. when they get some money. That's what Hamilton's saying. So we got to buy their loyalty. Wow. Guess who else are saying that? Jefferson. And Hamilton's right. Yeah, but we need them. Today, rich people would never like go invest in other countries to avoid helping the U.S. They would never like shelter their money in tax shelters like in the Cayman Islands or Ireland. Would they? Let me phrase that. They do it all the time. And so Hamilton kind of knew what kind of people they were back then. So then the wealthy would take that money, all their new wealth, and invest in manufacturing. And what would they buy? The machines, AKA capital, they would become what we would call the capitalists. Were there any, was there any manufacturer in the U.S.? No. So they're going to create. By the way, do you get the point here? Isn't this a pretty amazing plan? Do you see why they all hated Hamilton? I said, what are you up to? You're always up to something. Yeah. So, 
capital the means of production, not the machines. So then capitalists? The person owns the machines. Yeah, that's all, you know, it's just one of those, they own the machines. What's, you know, the capital would be like, if you're a banker, it's money, but everything else is like the actual fact. Which is, and they didn't exist in the U.S. The only place that, that existed was in Britain. Yeah. Well, it depends on your what your definition of health is. Isn't that a great way to weasel word? Aren't they just sound just so weaselly now? Everything does. I know it's just like you say, you know, personally, I think Karen's in the group, but then they probably didn't think that was. Oh no, they knew. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> but um, health, okay. Hamilton would have said, hey, the best way to prosperity the whole country is to have a few capitalists. Um, organized machines and factories didn't make a lot of money because then there'll be prosperity to everybody. But Jefferson would say, well, your policies are going to kick small farmers off their land and they're going to make basically slaves to capitalists. That's what he said, literally. The term would soon be wage slaves. So it really depends on what your definition of health is. And we'll come, it's, uh, there's no black, white. I mean, I can tell you what I think, but I try to get both sides. I mean, try to present it, and I also try to present it as as even though I kind of got to make it a little dry, but I don't think it's that dry. I, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. So when people say today that they have to take capitalism, what are they referring to? What is that? We'll get to capitalism from out of the Industrial Revolution. Oh, okay. But capitalism is where just a few people own the machines. Because how many people could actually own factories? A limited number. So they, they, they're, that's what they're mad about. But a lot of people might say it and not really know what they're mad about. Yes. The same thing you see, you know, those really for capitalism and say, I hate socialism. Which will get and they kind of don't really know what they hate. You see both of them. And that's what, there's so many gray areas. And oh, and that's also why I'm very much opposed to absolutes. Yes. Yeah, you might have noticed that. Just a little bit. Have a good day, everybody. We're up when you find work. And that's a good question. It really depends on your morals. What matters for a time? Only the couple of powerful videos. That's what you want. Have a good day. Wait, wait, wait. There's one of those, one more thing I'll show you. See you tomorrow. And uh, so we did the Bill of Rights week yesterday, okay. and I did assign to finish up chapter six. And I actually I decided I'm going to do that for my team. So you guys did that Bill of Rights quiz and then you know. Wait for me. Yeah. Not blocking away. Yeah. It's all your Thank you. Aspen. Is that what it is? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Place called
Civic Center, right? Is that where that? Via Townsend. So you have this nice long walk and then be ready to roll for the PSAT. And the PSAT lasts until like 8 o'clock at night, right? Is that correct? Yeah. It's 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock at night. Well, you have lunch. I forgot lunch. Four hours, four and a half hours, isn't it? Yeah. Good. That's so exciting. Anyway, I envy you. It's actually good practice because the standardized tests are. Our steps. And so, so I'm going to post a nine question quiz, and if everything goes right, uh, it'll be tomorrow. I'll put it up like, I'll post it like 7 a.m. or go seven. And it'll be for the next day and a half. Here we go. Just do it sometime. It'll take you five minutes. In fact, I'm so confident it'll take you five minutes. That there's a five minute, five minute time. Limit. So you have five minutes. Which I think I have eight, I think max would be nine matching. You should be done with I don't think that'll be a problem. Yeah. 
And it's just on um, the chapter six. Right? Now, chapter six, basically, from when Washington was elected until Adam, Adam, um, out of office. Okay. The two, the first two presidents. And so things like you know the Assumption Bill, the National Bank, the Treaty of Green Bill, things like those, you know. Those. And then what's the homework? I'm giving you a big bunch of homework that, but that won't be until Monday. You have to read chapter seven. Seven is a shorter chapter because chapter six is so crazy long. So you got to do chapter seven. I know, that's the way it is. But for Monday, hey, you got the PSAT, so it's almost like a day off. So for those of you tomorrow, I'll let you, you can bring your American book, you can read in class. You're going to be here. Who's, who's that? Who's in here tomorrow? Yeah, here. So I'll just, just bring your book, we do the quiz. You just do the quiz tomorrow in class. You can read, I'll let you do we'll, the We'll make up that quiz you have. No, no spot. It's all good? All right, let's go ahead and put the, now let's go and get started then. We have the first. Did we get right to the Second Amendment? Is that where we're quit? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well-trained militia. And so, oh, what was the group that opposed the Constitution? Anti-Federalists, and they, um, and so obviously, who wanted the Constitution? The Antis, no, the Federalists, yes, the Federalists. And. What do you call the system of government? This should be very easy now. The system of government where you have like the national government and state government so with separate powers, the national government, state government, and then within the state you have county and city. And that's where people pick their elected officials. What is that called? That's what? Say it again. Federalism, yeah. That's federalism. And if you did not know that, you might want to jot that down again. Because that's something you just know. Federalism is something you just have to know. Those are there are separate powers for the national government or the state government. But let's also review. What is that clause of the Constitution that gives more power to the national government so it makes the state national divide a little bit gray? What do you call that clause that gives more power to the national government? Say it again. Yeah, necessary and proper or implied powers or the elastic clause. Three names. And that's another one. If you did not know that, that's something you need to know. You need to know those are implied powers. Because this argument is going to come back time after time, especially as a way to stop legislation. And who wrote the Bill of Rights? And he wrote 12, 10 came out, 10 would be ratified, one in 1993. And remember, I went through the whole thing. There's a lot of gray area in this, isn't there? You do not have blanket freedom of speech. Let me give you an example, because this is something I heard last night. So I was watching a football game last night. And it could be a very good game, because the first half, in fact, the first half, three, two and a half quarters were like, I was dozing off. And then all of a sudden it became a great game. But the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, and by the way, everyone should hate the Raiders. If you have a soul, you hate the Raiders. I'm just throwing that out there. Especially in with the Las Vegas. But back to this. So their head coach resigned because he um, sent out emails that were uh, racist, homophobic, and misogynistic. What's misogynistic? Yeah, so basically mocking women. Yeah. And he's clearly that. And, um, but also kind of an arrogant idiot. Because you don't send emails where you say things like that, where you know you could potentially get in trouble on work-related email. I mean, that's just stupid and arrogant. He just, I mean, he's a rocket. But he got caught and he resigned because he was going to get fired. He was, I mean, he's gonna, he was going to get fired for this. And somebody said, that goes against his constitutional right of free speech. I'm not defending what he said, but he had the right to free speech. Did he have the right to free speech? Nowhere does it say that businesses um, can't restrict, or um, businesses must make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It says Congress. They can fire you for stuff you say anytime they want. Now, Montana has pretty restrictive worker laws. In fact, the most restrictive in the United States to protect workers' rights. 
everybody else, I mean, they can fire you for anything you say, pretty much. And that includes, let's say you go on, what are all these social media things, like the Instagram or the YouTube or uh, the, uh, the TikTok or the uh, tic-tac-toe or the uh, uh, Facebook, or if you say something on that, they can fire you for stuff you do on that. You don't have freedom of speech. Now, maybe we could argue, maybe you should have some, but you don't. And so when people say, my constitutional right has been violated because some company has restricted what I said. Uh -uh. Nowhere does it say that. Do not have that as comments. And I always get a kick out when people say that, and they, they get so indignant. I care only about the Constitution and rights. Well, you care so much, you have no idea what you're talking about. So at that, so we got right here, right? Regulate its well trend. What's a state? Yeah, that's the nation. But it's also individual states. It's both. By the way, that makes it kind of gobbledygook. Isn't that kind of gobbledygook? I mean, really, what are they talking about here? But don't forget, states wanted a militia. What was the big reason they wanted a militia? Because fear of what? Slave rebellion. So, what are the people? How does the Constitution begin? Do you remember that when I, we just read the preamble and you guys were walking out? We the, we the people. So that means, I know that, I'm about the people. The people. Does that make sense? Yeah, the people of the United States. Not necessarily individuals. It just means us. All of us. We the people. So, what are arms? Some muskets are, some muskets are. By the way, no one in this class went arms. Thank you. <laughs> that joke's never been used before. <laughs> some muskets are arms, some muskets aren't. What are arms? Now we're talking about what matters is context. We have to put it in context of 1789. What do the word arms mean in 1789? When Madison said arms, he meant very particular things. You notice what I said. Some muskets are arms, some muskets aren't. A knife is not an arm. A bayonet is an arm. A hunting rifle is not an arm. But a cannon is an arm. Military weapon. Has everyone got that? Arms or military weapons. So in a, it's not really clear here. So a well-trained militia will be armed. People will have arms in a well-trained militia, and it's for the state. We're not clear if that meant like the United States or the individual states, and Madison did that on purpose because he thought the federal government should run the militias. He didn't want to write the state of individual militias, so he wrote gobbledygook. Literally. So what does it say? Well, we have to go back to what was Madison thinking. And by the way, that's when I said both of these two cartoons, implying that the, uh, people talk about uh, the right to bear arms. And this one says, hey, yeah, uh, the right to bear arms is only muskets then. And people, have, there's all kinds of new weapons, so we should be able to restrict arms. And here it's saying the right to bear arms, are not, we have to have weapons to protect the people from tyranny. Both of those miss the point of the Second Amendment. Why do we know what the point was? Let's look what Madison originally wrote for the Second Amendment. There is without a doubt, there's no doubt, I mean, that this is clearly about militia. That is. Okay, everyone look at me funny, and you just, you're just waiting till I know it is. Yeah, okay. Let's go back. I did send an email yesterday in seventh period. Can we please change the background picture? I want a different random valley scene. See, last year I had a, 